Welcome to the Restless Creatives podcast. Comfortable chats with inspirational creatives. Hosted by three self-confessed restless creatives, Lucy Hunter, Fiona Pickles and Bridget Girling. This week, we chat with talented commercial and landscape photographer, Richard Allenbury Pratt. After many years living in the Middle East, Richard now lives in the depths of rural Suffolk, hence some of the sound issues you will notice in this episode. He is now developing a photographic documentary of Suffolk on Instagram called The Suffolk Project, which enables him to explore his interest in food and farming sustainability and the human relationship with nature, landscape, soil and wildlife. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I'm like your grandparents, you know. <laughs> and you're not me laugh. Hang on. What does this button do? <laughs> Hello there. Hello there. Hello. So, uh, I'm, I'm Bridget. I know, yeah. Oh, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there's Lucy. And there's Fiona. And I'm Fiona. Oh, Hi. Okay, that's uh, lovely to join you today. Well, it's very lovely to have you with us. Very lovely. Where are you? Um, I'm in my shed. <laughs> Excellent. Sure. The best place to be. Oh, it's like an upturned boat or something. I was going to do as you suggested, Bridget, and light a fire and set up in front of the fire. And then I realised at the last minute that um, my son would be kicking around and also he's, he's, he's a bit upset because I just announced 15 minutes ago that he couldn't use any internet connected device <laughs> because I realised he might hog the bandwidth, you know, and, and uh, so... Um, so he's hopping a strop. <laughs> not a strop, but um, he... Um, but, but yeah, I thought I would, I'd better get out of his way and come to the show. Crazy, isn't it, in this day and age that you still sometimes find yourself outside in the middle of the garden on a freezing night trying to <laughs> trying to talk to someone. Holding your phone in the air. <laughs> yeah, and yet my husband can be in the middle of nowhere in the ocean and has perfect, perfect signal. Really? Yeah, in the, yeah, in the bedroom upstairs. I think it's all <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> So are you two close to each other then in Suffolk? Well, Suffolk's quite a big county and we're at opposite ends really, aren't we? Oh, okay. <laughs> we're near Barry, is it? Yes. Yeah, so well, like an hour's drive, I suppose. Yes, Richard's near the coast, which is where I'd like okay. to be one day. Mm, mm. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. Actually, you're in a beautiful village, aren't you? Um, yeah, sort of, yeah, not one of the most beautiful villages because I couldn't afford that, but... Um, <laughs> It's a nice, um, yeah, it's a nice village. They're all nice, aren't they, around, you know, once you get out of it, so, um, yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's all pretty lovely, really, and we're very lucky, yeah. yeah. And you seem to have got a river near you. You seem to be very drawn to rivers. Oh, well, um, yes. Well, that's, that's a good observation. Is that, is that, do I, have you been looking at my other Instagram account? Or? <laughs> I may have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no point in having a guest on and not doing a little bit of research. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, the river, the river that runs through uh, Yoxford, which is the River Yox, because obviously the village was based on a ford over the Yox, um, and um, or maybe it was a ford for oxes. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but um, it's very tiny. It's just one of those sort of typical kind of drainage ditches, really, that you get around here. Not not much more than that. But it does eventually become the river. See, the, Suffolk's funny in that the rivers tend to change names. You know, halfway along their course, um, it's an odd, um, it's an odd thing they do around there. But the yachts become the Min, the River Min, um, which eventually drains itself into the marshes, which are Minsmere, which is oh, okay. one of the most important yes. nature reserves in the country. My history with rivers is more from the West Country, because I grew up sort of close to the River Severn, and a lot of my childhood memories are of being by the River Severn and fishing and going fishing with my dad. And, and then what Bridget might 
have seen is that a couple of years ago, I, I was awarded a commission to do a personal project for an exhibition that compared my life in the UK with the period of time I spent living in the Middle East. And one of the things when I was living in the Middle East, although the nature there was very beautiful, the desert is, is, is a fascinating and beautiful place, I did terribly miss the rivers of home um, and sort of being able to sit next to flowing water. And while I was over there, I noticed that there were these sort of landscape features that looked like rivers. Um, and so I started doing a bit of research into it. And uh, up until the end of the last ice age, there were, in fact, flowing rivers in the deserts, what are now the deserts of the United Arab Emirates. And so I did a sort of series of photographs of these what I called extinct rivers. Um, and then I, for one leg of the project, and then the other leg of the project, I photographed the rivers that I'd grown up by, which are the River Seven and the River Y and the River Teen. And I sort of compared those two places. And um, that, uh, yeah, so that was a real indulgence to, to have someone pay me to do such a personal I project. I don't, I don't normally do such personal project. I guess no. we haven't even mentioned the fact that that is what you do. You are a photographer and you've been a photographer, well, dare I say it, for years. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been doing for a living um, for, yeah, quite a long time. Um, I started off in London working as an assistant for commercial photographers mainly, editorial and advertising and and, and all manner of different people and and uh, I did that for quite a quite a while actually in the 90s I suppose and then I started myself as a commercial photographer in the late 90s and then in the 2000s I relocated to Dubai um, that's another story um, and then I eventually came back here in 2016 to rural Suffolk yeah so when, how did your interest in photography start? I mean, at what age did you get your first camera? Who influenced you? Where did um, this all come well, from? I, I went and did a, after school I was, um, well, I, I was a bit of a confused youth, I think, but I, I went and did <laughs> no, a, we won't be all. Like, <laughs> I went and did a foundation course in art um, and, discovered that I wasn't the brilliant painter or <laughs> drawer that I thought I was <laughs> and um, and got into photography at the same time. Um, so yeah, just another failed painter. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what has drawn you to landscapes particularly, do you think? I mean, your wish to do that, although you do do portraits as well, don't you? Yeah, I sort of do everything but I do think at heart I'm sort of a landscape photographer yeah it's best to photograph what you love you know what what you like the most and what what you're most interested in um and uh landscape um and being outdoors and being on my own in wild places is is probably the thing I like doing the most so um yeah so but I, I mean, I, I do work in all sorts of other genres of photography. Um, so professionally, I was, um, well, up until COVID, I was a professional car photographer. I did advertising campaigns for, for lots of different brands, Mercedes, Porsche, Nissan, GMC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that was really my specialism for probably 15 years, I suppose. But all the time I was doing that professional work, I was also doing personal projects, which were um, more about landscape. I mean, the funny thing was I got into car photography because it was one of the few ways commercially you can utilize landscape photography. Um, obviously mm. a, lot, a lot of the time is spent out in wild and beautiful landscapes. Um, 
photographing cars, yeah. Um, but my personal work was always concerned with other um, things. Well, I think that's what's really interesting, actually. You're, you're, you're... In fact, I'd like to know more about... Because you're very... You seem to be very, very interested in the environment and the human impact on the environment and sustainability and food production. And I'm just wondering where this all came from. And you, you did tell the story somewhere I read about catching that fish in the River Severn. <laughs> I think it was the River Severn, wasn't it? And being so excited with your first fish you ever caught, rushing home to show your dad. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. And then you did say, well, it wouldn't take much psychoanalysis to work out where this took me, but I'd like you to tell us about that. <laughs> Um, oh, well, you, you, uh, yeah, you, you caught me a little bit with that one. I wasn't that. Um, the psychoanalysis, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, that, I guess, is really that, well, it's also stuff to do with your father, but uh, which I won't go into, but, but it's that sense of extraordinary wonder with nature, you know, um, and this is the thing about fishing, you and I know a lot of people struggle to be interested or to see what could possibly be interesting about that. But you know, with fishing, you dip this line into another world, you know, and it's a world you don't, for the most part, get to see. But then just occasionally, you hoist these extraordinary creatures out of that other medium. Mm -hmm. For a moment, you just get to engage with, it's almost like an alien world. And I mean, probably not so much as it is for the fish, who you know, we have all these sort of stories of sort of being zapped up into a spaceship for an alien, <laughs> and fish actually get to live that experience, don't they? You know, they can... <laughs> and then, because most of the fishing I do doesn't involve killing the fish, they get to return to uh, where they came from, but um, <clears throat> but yes, I mean, and the other thing about fishing is that the, the type of fishing I mostly do, which is really quite lazy and inactive, you know, you tend to just sit there and contemplate the water, you know, and there's long periods of absolutely nothing really of great interest happening, um, and. I don't think there is, I can't think of any other circumstances under which you really do that in life, you know, just to really just stare at moving water for several hours, you know, without becoming insanely bored. Um, so I think it's a sort of meditation. And I, and I think Guinness actually years ago did a TV ad, didn't they, where they, where they, they compared, you know, people thrashing away at golf balls and then <laughs> a guy just sat there by the water's edge gazing out. Do you remember? Does anyone remember that? Yeah, I do vaguely. Yeah. I'm, th I'm thinking of... Uh... You all think fishing is mad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of the Guinness ad with the horses. There were oh. lots of really good Guinness ads, actually, weren't there? But I don't remember well, this that one. that was Lloyd's Bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on a very strange tangent <laughs> anyway sorry back to guinness and the fish <laughs> yes because what i was going to say is is you you took this fish back to your dad didn't you and then right. the, you took this fish back to your dad and then you released it back into uh, yeah. the water <laughs> okay the full story yeah yes. i i ran it home in a leaky bucket when i was this would have been when I was 10 or even less than 10, I don't know, I ran home in a leaky bucket and I showed it right side to my dad. And then I, and he said, well, you better get it back in the water quick. So, um, so I ran back and I released the fish. Um, and then the next day we were driving past the spot where I was fishing and I asked him to pull the car over and we pulled the car over and, um, and I went and looked at the spot. I'm still, I suppose, still trying to recapture the excitement of that great mm. momentum. 
and there was a dead fish washed up on the side of the oh. bank. And I was absolutely uh, distraught. I, I remember it. But it, it's interesting that you you mentioned that, Bridget, I, because I, I, don't, I don't know whether that was the beginning of some sort of sensitivity with regard to environmental and, and matters and nature. What I, I think was actually the more um, influential thing for me was living in the Middle East and seeing the manner in which consumption there um, was carrying on. You know, particularly, obviously, I was mainly based in Dubai. And, you know, I was aghast at the way um, the natural world was disregarded and the, the consumption, you know, in a country where everything is, literally everything is imported. Um, I mean, obviously, over there, they have cooling rather than heating, but they have these vast cathedrals, shopping malls, which you need to wear a, a down coat in they're, they're so cold in the middle of summer when it's 45 degrees Celsius outside. Um, and the amount of energy that is consumed there is, is, is absolutely mind-boggling. They, they used to have the position as the world's sort of top carbon consumer, carbon footprint per capita. Um, but the funny thing is that, well, I think the funny thing is while calculating these figures, nobody was really considering the fact that at least 60% of the population are um, Asian expats who live in cramped accommodation for four or six to a room. Mm -hmm. So there, as individuals, their carbon footprint is minuscule. 60% mm. of the population are hardly consuming any energy. And it gives you some idea how much energy the rest of the population, mm -hmm. expats, mm -hmm. wealthy expats like myself, um, then at the more extreme end of the scale, you know, the ultra wealthy, um, locals who are air conditioning whole palaces, you know, for no reason whatsoever. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think that, um, and there's a culture of consumption there, I think a little bit like some aspects of American society where culturally one demonstrates one's affluence and generosity and hospitality by shows of excessive consumption. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a shameful thing if you finish the plate of food because oh, it means yeah. you not given enough. So you have those kind of aspects of, of and those are, you know, in the Middle East, comes out of societies that obviously have been at the extreme end of poverty and and you know the sort of fragility of life, you know, so for them to celebrate their newfound affluence is a natural thing to do. And I think that society is is um, is maturing quite quickly. So I, I think those things will change. But to answer your original question, I think that is the more critical thing that spiked my interest in sustainability and consumption and the way we live. And I knew I always wanted to come back and live in the British countryside. Um, and when I came to Suffolk, because it's primarily a sort of agricultural and arable landscape, I knew straight away that was the main thing that I was going to take it. Um, and I am fascinated by the economics of agriculture and how that interacts with conservation and the natural world. 
um, and you know, trying to just learn about these things. I think your um, your for anybody that's seen your Instagram feed, I think you you travel a very careful line of showing a beautiful image and describing what's happening in that image and asking the question of of what's happening and should it be happening and how it could be different and if it should be different and then allowing people to comment on that as well and i think that's that's very very clever because it's a very complex issue isn't <laughs> it and i think we're all becoming much more aware of it but um I mean, I noticed that you've read Isabella Tree's book, Wilding, and you're you're clearly interested in the regener re regeneration of some of the agricultural land and practices. But it's it's difficult, isn't it, when it's a an environment, particularly here, that is so heavily focused on agriculture and maximising what you can get out of the soil. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's it would be really harsh to negatively judge farmers working in a conventional manner. They've, they've grown up into a system that wasn't their idea or choice, but they are. They also are still fulfilling that basic challenge that any farmer has always had, which is to maximize their yields. I mean, all farmers throughout history have tried to maximize their yields. So it's a very difficult situation they find themselves in where they have this ability to, you know, to, to, to maximize their yields to the point that they're leaving mm -hmm. nothing for anyone else. Um, and it's an extra, and I, I do have an enormous respect and admiration for the people who are, it's an extraordinary act of bravery to make the choice to to change that system, the, the way you've grown up, the way your father did it, the attitudes of people in the past. I mean, it's 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 enormous, and you just you can't expect everyone to do that immediately. And um, and obviously we, we as consumers and retailers, we all need to get on board. Um, so just you know, blaming farmers would be would be stupid. Mm. Um, and I mean, you're right about asking questions. I, I, I feel I'm better at asking questions than answering them. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's nice to do that on Instagram because I'm the first to admit this is a process of learning for me. Um, and trying, trying to learn and, you know, not, not judge so much. Um, because your, your Instagram is called the Suffolk Project and, and you are literally winkling out really interesting aspects of the area we live in and the people who live in that area and the things they're doing and how they're doing it. And some of them are more traditional and in every sense and some of them are really avant-garde in, in every sense as well. And yet the two meld together really rather beautifully. I mean, for example, you working quite closely with the agroforestry um Wakeland. yes Wakeland and, and that's just what they're doing is incredible you raise the point as well quite often that the the financial viability of it can be questioned but what they're doing and how they're trying to use the land and the soil in a very uh, sustainable way is is fascinating and you're documenting it with your photographs wow. which is beautiful um, is it they, yes, the the, the Wakeland story is is amazing. I mean, they are farming in a way that is actually better or more sustainable than our forefathers and their fathers farmed. I mean, they're actually they're not just gone back to the old ways in terms of mixed rotations and non-use of chemicals and stuff like that but they've actually they're actually improved on that those ideas um and with with new systems i mean it's the work of um the current owner's father um martin was a government scientific you know seed genetic researcher 
And it was, Wakelands was almost like his retirement project. And whereas, whereas seed distribution, seed, seed choices, seed, seed selections for conventional agriculture have become more and more limited, you know, to your maximum yield, you know, fastest growing, highest gluten kind of mm -hmm. seeds, and they become less and less diversity. Martin ended up arguing for exactly the opposite, that actually we should be growing genetically diverse crops and that we should be rotating and mixing our crops um, and we should be resting our soil. And we, you know, and they're taking it even further now with, you know, no dig mm -hmm. agriculture going on there and, and, and so forth. Um, and yeah, what they're doing is is absolutely tremendous. Um, but you raise the point of the, you know, the economic issue, and that is really important to me because, you know, it's what we do on the grand scale mm -hmm. that that actually really matters. Now, Wakefield can be, and the other sort of small number of farmers like them are obviously the pioneers and they are setting the example but other farmers are going to need to see it working economically mm. in order to be convinced to change what they're currently doing now some organic farmers have argued mm. that mm. it's not working economically conventional farming is not working economically either so these are all subjects that i would like to learn more about and to plan on but I mean, I think it's, you know, it is, it does become incredibly complex. Um, and uh, I would like to spend more time actually photographing conventional farming. And I know it probably seems like, you know, I do, I'm only working with organic or, or alternative farmers. But that's really because they're the ones who are open to um, open to showing what they're doing and they're often people who have their own food brands which need promoting or you know like Wakelands they're also trying to sell other things they're trying to sell accommodation on the farm and you know all the other ways they try to make revenue so they're all open to to you know, being looked at and, and being promoted. Most conventional farmers, it's, it's, it's not that they're trying to hide anything, it's just that what's their interest? They sell all the products they grow to wholesalers, you know, and the rest is really scrutiny that is going to be not welcome. Mm. Um, and so how are you going to develop that avenue? How are you going to... Uh... Just, well, it's... I know it seems like I've been doing this a while, but it's not really... I mean, half the time I've been doing this has been COVID. Um, and, and the other half, I was really just starting to make connections. And obviously, that's one, of, that's one of the reasons why it's important that I don't be sort of all judgy and critical. Because otherwise, I for sure I'll be blocked. I'll be blocked out. I won't mm. be given access. Um, but there's still quite a lot you can do with conventional farming. You know, just photographing from public footpaths and so forth. So there's still quite a lot you can do. Mm. Just kind of guessing a little bit. At, you know, when I see the sprayer out on our local crop, um, I can try and flag the guy down. Sometimes I manage to flag him down, and they'll they'll sort of tell me what they're doing but um so it's more the knowledge you know you can see what they're doing but you don't know i don't know if they're spraying a pesticide or a growth regulator or mm. you know nitrogen i i mean i i don't know what they're doing and that that's a bit frustrating for me i mean i i i, I want to learn i want to know what they're up to yeah so what do you ultimately feel like you're going to be doing with the mm. suffolk project because you seem to be gathering together a whole array of information and beautiful images and do you have a direction or are you still looking for that well you, you know what i 
I obviously have to commercialize things a little bit more um, because I have to make it clear, you know, I'm trying to grow an audience, obviously, but I also have to make it mm. clear that I am, you know, camera for hire. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I've always thought that the photography I'm doing on the Suffolk Project is really just the sort of background mm. research and that I will do more considered or conceptual artistic projects in the fullness of time, but that doesn't seem to be making much progress with that. But I'm also starting to feel like the pictures I'm taking on a daily basis, perhaps they are enough or they are they are somehow they have the validity themselves as as that sort of just documentary story. Um, I hope to build a, an archive of images so eventually after a period of time you know people can phone me up and you know they might want to do a story on this or they might want to do pictures for commercial purposes or and I can provide the imagery you know that I have sufficient archive of images that I can I can fulfill the need of people needing pictures relating to Suffolk particularly on the agriculture and conservation. Um, I was lucky enough last year to get one sort of nice commercial job, which was Ipswich Building Society, who are rebranding as the Suffolk Building Society. And they, um, they partnered with me to produce a sort of library of images um, for use in their communications with with regard to that chain. And, you know, having got to know them a little bit, you know, they're a really great company and they're typical of the kind of smaller local company that I would like to support. Um, because that's another aspect of commercial aspect. Obviously, I've got to make a living, but I also want to do what I can to, to promote the products and services and of Suffolk, you know. Um, and I think Suffolk has quite a strong brand identity and a brand value. And I'd just like to help build that, you know. Um, the more people know about Suffolk and any products that come from Suffolk, you know, will have will be positive associations with those things. And in that way, I can contribute to my own community um, and my own landscape as well. Because, you know, if associations with Suffolk are connected with nature and, and sustainability and things like that, then that will all help to perpetuate mm. that aspect of, of the place. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I want everywhere to be like that, not just something. But, um. <laughs> You've got to start somewhere. Start somewhere, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel like your commercial commercial work in the future will be very local rather than worldwide? Because you did used to travel a lot, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, mostly I worked on regional or global advertising campaigns. Um, yes. I mean, I don't know if that's a pipe dream, to be honest, but because it's really just something for money. Um, and also, I have the challenges in my profession now that everyone already has a photographer, or they know the photographer, or they're great aunt, and, you know, and, and she takes great pictures. You know, so I have that problem. Um, but I would love to. You know, I would love to have half a dozen of the biggest brands as a portfolio that I was an ambassador for, for instance, and, and um, work for them and tell their stories and tell mm -hmm. the stories, their efforts to be ethical and sustainable companies and, and you know, and to enhance um, the suffering landscape and community. You know, yes, that, that would be my dream. Um, and it's also to reduce my own carbon footprint, you know, because mm. traveling 
workers. You know, I mean, not okay, really. I, I, for my first couple of years back here, I felt like a fraud because I was still having, in order to earn any money, I was still having to get on an airplane, you know, and I really don't want to do that. But it's it's just... Needs must. So hard to (laughs) show, you know. I mean, like the farmers, we didn't invent the system. We didn't invent this sort of capitalist system um, and um, and the globalised system. Um... So um, we, we just have to manage as best we can. Most people are just managing as best they can, you know, and issues of sustainability and, and consumption, minimizing the consumption, you know, are, are secondary factors in most people's lives. And even when you see the people who, for whom they are the main factor in their lives, you know, the more, the more passionate people, again, the great majority of them are fairly well off. <laughs> so, um, um, so um, yeah, so it's it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. I I will I'll be delighted to start working for more stuff at companies, but also for individuals as well. It doesn't need to be for companies, you know. I can do weddings, bar mitzvahs. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Available for hire. <laughs> But you're very creative in in your. Um, I mean, you've done some amazing exhibitions. I I know they're your your personal projects. But for example, abandoned that you did, that that was pretty well received around the world, wasn't it? So you've got a very clear creative eye. And I'm just wondering where these ideas come from. Well, abandoned was a. Was I suppose abandoned was the exception rather than the rule. <laughs> <laughs> I was like two minutes of both. Um, I, um, so well, most of the work that I do is, is more documentary. The abandoned project was, well, it was, I suppose it was the result of the, the um, recession, the financial recession that started around 2009. Mm-hmm. And like a lot of people, I didn't have any work at that time available work or my clients stopped commissioning and so I and also actually my son had just been born and my wife manager of uh, the company so I was you know I became a bit of a stay-at-home dad at that time and so in my spare time I I made that project um, over the course of a, a couple of years um, so it was a little bit unusual for me in that it was quite a sort of conceptual um, um, project, um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then I had that very strange experience of, of something unexpectedly going viral. <laughs> I suppose we should explain. You you had, I mean, some of your images are quite um, hauntingly. These were the UAE images as well, weren't they? They were mainly around Dubai. Um, the photographs were primarily just straight views of the sort of abandoned building sites. So during 2009, when when the financial crisis hit Dubai, the work on the many building sites just abruptly came to a halt, and they were just sort of mothballed these places or really just abandoned and they were really quite surreal atmosphere in these places um so i started going around photographing those um and then i started i suppose inspired by some of those sort of films that one with will smith um where he's sort of last heard live in New York and there's there's kind of heads of deer wandering through the city. Oh, and anyway, I started started thinking about when I created those images, you know, with with this idea that the city had been abandoned and um and before the people had left they'd opened the doors and the gates to the zoos and the many private 
animal collections that they have over there. You know, everyone, if you don't have a pet cheetah, you're nobody over there. <laughs> Oh, no, that's that's such a scary thing. You keep seeing photographs of them coming up in my search, and it's like I don't want to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I had a neighbour with a cheetah. We used to scratch his head when we went out for a walk. You know, um, beautiful animal. But at uh, least you scratched its head rather than it scratched yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the idea was that all of those animals were released because, you know, if you had to leave the country in a hurry, what, what would you do with your animals? You're like, just open the doors. So the idea was the scenes that I created were of these animals wandering out into the abandoned city. Yeah, and it, it garnered a lot of interest um, from the media around the world and was featured in lots of um, national papers and internet sites and it was sort of discussed and it it was it became described as post-apocalyptic um, that, that it was a post-apocalyptic and it sort of got shoved into that category of post-apocalyptic art um, but which I thought was sort of ironic because yeah, it didn't, I mean it might you might might consider it post-apocalyptic in the sense that, you know, it's a bit of a disaster, obviously, for Dubai and the residents of Dubai, but in fact, for the planet, it's anything but post-apocalyptic. Mm. Sorry, I should make it clear, the scenario which I imagined was that Dubai was abandoned because an alternative form of energy, which was sustainable and free, um, was invented. And so the value of oil plummeted, and that resulted in a um, conflict in, in, in the Middle East, in the, the Arabian Gulf region. So, you know, it wasn't really post-apocalyptic to imagine that we had discovered a free and clean source of, source of energy. Um, you could call that optimistic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> news for those handful of people who make billions of dollars in oil. I yeah. guess it's quite interesting, isn't it, when people sort of, um, when you do a piece of work like that, you put it out there and then it's open to interpretation and people can interpret it however they like and read into it whatever they like, which is quite difficult as the author of that work, or could be. Mm. Yeah, well, it was actually really gratifying at, at, at that time because lots of people wrote lots of things about the project and a lot of them were things I hadn't even thought of and they, they sort of made me sound very clever and now, <laughs> I, now, I, now I probably say those things back to other people who ask, you know, but I never thought of it as a journalist, you know, in, in, in America's um, interpretation. Um, um, yeah, no, I mean, in this instance, that was okay, you know, because it was all, it was all pretty positive. Um, so, yeah, but it's, 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 it's an odd thing. I mean, this whole going viral as a kind of thing is, it's very strange, you know, because and I, I wasn't ready for it and I didn't, I wasn't even on social media at that point. I mean, sure, if I had an Instagram account at that time, I would, you know, I would, I might have as many followers as you guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, but I wasn't and I, and I had nothing to sell, you know, I didn't mm. book doing an exhibition or wasn't, you know. Um, so there was no, you know, I think one day I looked at the stats on my website and I had quarter of a million visitors on my website. Oh, wow. day. Um, and, but, and it was just, just this odd, like, what do you do with that? You know, there should be yeah. some, there should be some value or something. I don't know. But, you know, eventually, I suppose with the fullness of time, you just realize that the internet is just so desperately hungry for anything to talk about. Mm can also get a little bit carried away with your own glory you know that being said that project i mean i did eventually do well my first solo exhibition of that project in 2012 was very well received and was very commercially um successful and i still 
you know, we're lucky photographers because we, we can do these limited editions. So, um, you know, you don't just sell things once. I mean, I'm, I'm still selling prints from that limited edition, you know, this month. Um, so it's still providing actually an income for me yeah. eventually. Um, and actually, you know, print sales has been one of the, one of the few things keeping me going during, during this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it, you know, in the end, it did turn out to be, you know, a tremendous thing. Mm-hmm. And there were awards and things like this. So, so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a great, a great boost for my career. Um, not so much my commercial photographic career, but, but my sort of art career. And, you know, and subsequently, you know, I think maybe the other things I've done have had more interest than they might have otherwise, you know, and, and so forth. You know. Um, yeah. So. So how do you protect this precious resource that you have? I ask this not for any other reason other than we need to know, because we take pictures too. It's like, where do you put them and make sure they're safe? <laughs> you mean a hard drive? Do? Yeah, but I mean, how many hard drives do you need? You could, Lots. something could happen. <laughs> Lucy has a bag of them. <laughs> a hard drive drawer. Um, exactly. I mean, simply put, you know, those things, you see that it says this is four terabytes, yeah, and it says 2020 B because I in 2020 I'd already used one of them. Oh, good grief! Um, um, so maybe it's four terabytes. No, it seems a lot. But anyway, I have a pile of those. I use different brands. My most important pictures, like portfolio pictures, I back up on multiple sources. And so on and so forth. I try to keep different hard drives in different places. I mean, at the moment, they're pretty much all in my shed. Oh dear. <laughs> Single point of failure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not tell anybody where your shed is. <laughs> I don't think they've, they've nicked the hard drives, but, um, um, but you know, no, fire, fire damage is, is obviously. Yeah, that's what I meant. If your shed burned down. <laughs> in a metal cabinet um but i um but yeah i need to move some i think i do have some off site somewhere but i i can't I, remember I, where <laughs> <laughs> buried in the garden <laughs> I, I was very confused and last i had a cottage in wales which was my kind of bachelor bolt hole and i i eventually sold it um actually yeah a little bit more than a year ago i sold my cottage but i used to keep a set of hard drives there um and i think now i think about it, it's good you remind me because i think they've all they've all come here but yeah i mean i thought you were going to mean protect your kind of image copyright. copyright um which is something i don't tend to sweat too much about because it's just so difficult to do and i think even mm-hmm. instagram i think if you look at the terms and conditions really closely you just wouldn't use it you know mm. you know i mean it doesn't seem that they abuse it but if you look at the terms of their conditions it seems to read like they can do what they like with your pictures and even even sell them you know with the abandoned project at that time um i just left it what they call open source so some people will have projects and they'll be very protective and they will try and very carefully control who uses it, how it's used and this sort of thing. But it's quite difficult to do that. Um, but I decided not to worry about it. You know, and I mean, I think at one, at one point I was contacted by agencies saying, you know, would you like us to represent those, that set of images? So that, you know, you can create, you know, to protect them and, and create an income from them. And I, well, I don't really see what the point is. I mean, it's been featured in so many publications and on so many websites. I mean, what social media, creative social media, where you, where you share projects and other members rate those projects. And that's where that 
abandoned project was initially sort of discovered by the media and then everyone just, you know, just helped themselves. Um, and I think probably, you know, that the publicity is probably, well, like the policing of it would be so difficult, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah. No, it's interesting, isn't it? So, as you say, there there seems to be two camps with the photographers. There's those like yourself who just kind of think, well, what okay. can I do? And then there's others that are watermarking everything. I know, and... right across the middle of the... Yes. <laughs> just so desperate not to have their work plagiarised, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I find those watermarks really ugly. You know, mm -hmm. um, I do. For me, Instagram, I was a reluctant joiner of Instagram actually because I never wanted to be never was and I never wanted to be addicted to my telephone and you know predictably I kind of am now uh, mm. and that makes me a little bit sad but on the upside I think Instagram is I, I now find it kind of amazing particularly as a medium for telling a complex and extended story, mm. you know, you can do it in these little daily bite sized mm. pieces, you know, and that's, you know, that's the nature of life and most of the things we're trying to learn about, isn't it? It's, it's, there is no great sweeping overview, you know, and, you know, it's really just these little bits and you, you, you know, and I, and I hope, you know, by it going on, going on like this, it will build and it will and something will become clear from it you know even mm -hmm. if i even if i don't know what it, it is at this point mm -hmm. you know it's really interesting isn't it because there's, there's um one of our growers is has been recently doing a sustainability project cell from um forever green i don't know if you've been seeing them she's been doing exactly that you know raising the profile of some of the really bad practices within floristry and flower growing and that and she's been calling it her sustainability series but she's been doing it through a really nice picture and then just the caption of it's just like little bite-sized pieces but it's really really raising awareness of yeah. some really horrible things that I mean I wasn't aware of you know just I mean some of the things that they were testing florists after they'd used flor uh, flowers and they had the chemicals within their body that Wow. these flowers had be, had put into them and it's like oh my goodness I never knew that I mean I used to be a big wedding florist using imported flowers and it's wow. Like, wow that's scary stuff mm. so it is a really useful platform mm. to raise important issues I think and, yeah. and you can you can raise them in a sort of gentle yeah. way to Without draw bashing people, people in over the head. Yeah. rather than exactly rather than um put people off which is rather wonderful obviously it depends on your tone but yeah <laughs> I mean yeah. I think you've nailed it Richard that's what's so clever mm -hmm. about what you're mm -hmm. doing is you're just gently pointing people in directions and letting them make their own mind up and you're saying I haven't made my mind up I don't know the answers help mm -hmm. me somebody somebody help me which is great on the, on, on the fence <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now Richard I'm conscious of the time and we have a t what we call the TRC five. So I've got some <laughs> quick fire questions for you. Fun five. Oh. Yeah, the fun <laughs> five. And you can answer them extensively or very quickly. It depends. It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the first one. What is the most dangerous thing you've ever done? My goodness. Straight in there, Bridget. Yeah. <laughs> um. Years ago, I was shooting a ad campaign for land, the new Range Rover, actually, um, in the Wahiba Sands of Oman, which is a beautiful sand dune desert area of Oman where they still have Bedouin um, living in tents. Um, and where we were shooting... We didn't realize in the background at some distance was one of these Bedouin, little Bedouin settlements and the guy took some offense and he, uh, he came up and screamed at us. Uh, and I said, look, I'm sorry, but we just don't have time for this. Uh, and so I just carried on working and this guy wandered off and then, um, uh, a beat up old 
Land Cruiser pickup came blasting up the sand dune next to me with this fella in it. And at this point, we had a herd of camels off in the distance, and everyone was trying to corral these camels into the right position for the shot. And so it was just me and my assistant on the top of the sand dune, and, um, you know, with my, with my camera on the tripod and that. And um, this Land Cruiser pickup turned up, <laughs> turned up next to me. And this Bedouin guy hoisted this ancient, like, flint lock. Blunderboss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the window of, uh, of, his, of his truck and, uh, and screamed something at me. And I think it was probably, probably one of the more dangerous things that had happened to me. But bizarrely at the time, because I'd always thought I might, you know, have an accident if someone ever pointed a, a gun at me. But for some reason, I was actually just in spent. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and also, I realized that, you know, A, his gun was ancient. B, I was on top of the sat, and he wasn't actually pointing it at me. He was pointing it slightly to one side in a, in a slightly passive way. Um, and, um, and I realized that, you know, if he did point it at me, I would probably have time to dive over the side of the sand on the other side of this <laughs> and I just said oh go on then shoot me shoot me or F off that's what I actually said to him and he looked incredibly crestfallen oh. <laughs> and he looked at me and then he pulled his gun back in and drove off um, at this point I turned around and I saw my assistant he was this young English fella, and he was lying his face in <laughs> just out of the I think that would be me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me. <laughs> I'd be the big cloud of sand in the distance. <laughs> yeah, me, like Riding that. the cattle away. <laughs> <laughs> the person he's, he's ever seen in his life. Yeah. Oh, dear. No, so that was kind of a long answer. Yeah, that, that, was, was, that was quite good. I, you know, that is um, quite a good We've asked one or two people about dangerous situations nobody's had uh -huh. a gun pulled on them <laughs> right maybe this one will be a bit easier for you lark or owl <laughs> okay. i'm definitely an owl person i think you know i hope i think you're an owl okay i don't know <laughs> What's the most inspiring place you've ever been to? <clears throat> oh, <God. laughs> not, not that place near the Bedouin. No, not, <laughs> not that. <laughs> oh, I just, shopping mall. Dangerous. What was the dangerous thing you've done? Because I was, um, I was caught in the tsunami in two thousand and four in Sri Lanka. Oh wow! Well. Actually, probably even more dangerous than the Bedouin. But, um, I think I think I have a special thing with Sri Lanka, I suppose, because of that. I mean, I used to go there quite a bit before the tsunami, and then quite a few times afterwards. And uh, with my my parents, my parents mainly, but we built a school in the village there after after the tsunami. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that. That's a special yeah. place for me. Um, mm -hmm. Inspiring. I don't know if it's inspiring. Um, well, it's obviously somewhere that really resonates with you. Well, that's... Um, why? I mean, I would go back to the rivers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's some places on the river team which runs through Worcestershire that is my sort of special place. It's probably the place I will ask my son to put my ashes, you know? Mm. That sounds lovely. Well, mm. kind of. <laughs> yes, yeah. Kind of Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Given the choice, walk or car? <laughs> well, I know the answer to this one, Bridge. <laughs> Oh, I mean, well, this I feel really guilty because I don't know how like honest I should be here. You know, <laughs> I love car adventures, you know, and um, 
particularly because the amazing thing about living in a desert is that you're not restricted to roads. I mean, you have a basic level of competency with a four-wheel drive car, and you actually travel across the landscape. Um, and, you know, exploration by vehicle is one of the most exciting and uh, things that I that I do. Um, but obviously, I'm a daily walker, and I love walking. And you know, and and you see nature up close and in detail when you walk. Um, That's so, why I asked the question. I knew it would be quite hard. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> Last question. What would be your desert island luxury? Why am I asking some good deep ones? Questions? <laughs> I, I would probably take up smoking again. <laughs> Nobody to tell you off. Northern <laughs> Virginia tobacco. <laughs> uh. <laughs> life, isn't it? Um, I um, what would I what what the luxury? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, my my Instagram account. <laughs> You're kidding! <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought you'd say a camera or something like that. But tobacco and Instagram. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Richard, for spending the time with us this morning. Thank you. Very fascinating. You guys wanted to talk to me, and um, I'm really in awe of what you all do. Uh, it's very lovely of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Your pictures are stunning, absolutely stunning. But I did want to ask, what is the collective noun for a group of floral? <laughs> a waft. Oh, yeah. A waft, <laughs> yeah. A bunch yeah. of nutters. <laughs> <laughs> Restless wafting. <laughs> yes, it probably wouldn't be very complimentary. <laughs> no. <laughs> but no, we really, really do appreciate you spending your time with us this morning. And... I love what you're doing with the Suffolk Project. More, please. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank and we'll, we'll uh, let you go so your son can get back on the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably on it. <laughs> uh, okay. Bye, Dan. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Oh, like, do you end it or do I end it? You can end it. You can end it. Hang <laughs> on, there you go. There you go. <laughs> You've been listening to the Restless Creatives podcast. To ensure you don't miss our next episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Restless Creatives podcast. If you'd prefer to listen rather than watch us, you can catch us on one of your favoured podcast providers. For more sneak peeks and behind the scenes fun, visit our Instagram at the.restlesscreatives or visit our website therestlesscreatives.co.uk